Ecclesiastes says several times, there's nothing new under the sun. And I just thought, well, we're seeing how that applies to heresies. Um, they just get recycled from the beginning of the church age until today. Uh, they take on different names. But if you study church history, which is something that I really enjoyed doing, you learn that there's really nothing new when it comes to them. And, uh, and most of them are attacks on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why this first chapter of Hebrews is so important because it sets us straight concerning Jesus, who he is and who he is not. And uh, it's really, I think, relevant because it hits at the heart of one particular heresy that's been very popular for the last hundred years. Well, not very popular, but it's been around for a hundred years. So we're going to learn about that. Let's begin in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. It says, God, who at various times and in diverse ways spoke long ago to the fathers through the prophets, various times and diverse ways. God used various methods to speak during Old Testament days. And if you think back, you'll remember them, I'm sure. He spoke to Moses through the burning bush. Remember that? Remember how he whispered to Elijah with his still, small voice? He spoke out loud to little Samuel in the middle of the night. And so he communicated to people in different ways. He communicated through angels and through dreams and through visions. And sometimes, like with Abraham, in human form. But verse 1 says, many times and in many different ways. But that changed. It says, God, who at various times and in diverse ways spoke long ago to the fathers through the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. Let's just stop there for a second. God says these are the last days, which proves beyond all doubt that God does not count time the way we do because he said that 2,000 years ago. These are the last days. But you got to understand what he meant by that. Well, number one, remember, God is eternal. He's separate from time. And I talked about this a few weeks ago. And that's why the Bible says a thousand years is like one day to God, and one day is like a thousand years. You know, he's just separate from time. We can't grasp that, but it's true. But according to God's reckoning, the last days of earth began over, well, about 2,000 years ago with the death of Jesus on the cross. That began the last days because it began the church age, which is the last period of time, the last segment of time before Jesus returns in judgment. But notice what it says in verse 2. Has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the world. Kind of interesting that Jesus made the world that he was later born into. I like to think about stuff like that. He made the world that he later came into, became a part of. But he has spoken to us through his son in these last days. And, well, look at verse 3. It says, he, Jesus, is the brightness of his glory, of God's glory, in the express image of himself. In other words, yeah, people and prophets and God's people got bits and pieces of God throughout Old Testament times. You know, they learned more about God as time went on. They learned more about his character. Uh, Adam and Eve knew something about God. And then when God destroyed the world through Sodom and Gomorrah, we learn some more about God, you know, and, and the flood, we learn more about God, and the law taught us a lot about God when Moses received that. So all these bits and pieces put together a profile of God and, and people, mankind, 
through this progressive revelation, learned more and more about him. But boy, when Jesus came on the scene, that was it. That was it. It doesn't get any fuller. We, it is impossible to get a fuller, more perfect revelation of God than what we have in Jesus Christ. And I'm not an expert on Islam, but I know that they teach the opposite of that. You know, that Jesus was just one of many prophets, but if you really want the, the real thing, you got to go to Muhammad. Well, see, all you have to do to believe stuff like that is just throw the Bible away. Then, you, then you're free to believe anything that you want to. But it simply isn't true. God, through the prophets, gave man bits and pieces of what he is like, but Jesus is God. So, therefore, he shows us exactly what the Father is like. There can be no greater representation of God than Jesus, because he is God. And verse 3 again. He is the brightness of his glory, the express image of himself, and upholds all things by the word of his power. I know I've talked about this in the past. Like I've said, you know, most Bible study is review after you've been a Christian for a sev several years. But it says that Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power. So everything stays in its proper place by the word of Jesus Christ. And I know there are natural laws that people look to, scientists look to, but guess who controls those natural laws? And guess all you got to do is read the book of Revelation to see that he can... He can, he can break the natural law anytime he wants to, and every time he does a miracle, it's a violation of natural law. So God is in control of those. He's steering the natural laws. He's in control of all these things, and everything stays in their proper place by the word of Jesus Christ. Jesus made all things, and he controls all things, and he keeps all things functioning the way they should. So that's why um, we can thank Jesus that the earth rotates once every 24 hours, day after day, right on schedule. And we can thank Jesus that the earth orbits around the sun every 365 days, right on schedule. And we can thank Jesus that the earth stays exactly where it is in relationship to the sun so that it doesn't draw even a little bit closer and we all burst into flames or pull just a little further away and we all freeze to death. So everything from the smallest thing that can only be seen by a, by a microscope to, to you know, the largest galaxy was made and is sustained by our Lord Jesus Christ. I was doing some reading. I don't know how I get into all these different subjects that I read throughout the week, but somehow I get into them. And this last week I was reading about gamma rays. I never knew anything about gamma rays. But I, I read... I read uh, about gamma rays, and I discovered that they are the highest energy form of radioactive waves known in the universe. And well, you know, whatever, big deal. And I was reading about them, and then I discovered that uh, an exploding star causes gamma rays to shoot out into outer space. And while I was reading that article, I discovered that some scientists are now worried that a gamma ray might explode out in outer space because of a star, and uh, it might hit Earth. And if it does, it could, you know, it could possibly destroy our ozone and wipe out our food chain and cause mass starvation. And when I read that, I thought, man, what else are you guys going to worry about? <laughs> you know, what else are you going to worry about? Because it's always something, you know. And I've got to say, when I read that, I thought, I am not worried about gamma rays. You know, I'll tell you what I'm worried about, okay? I am worried about the possibility of the Packers having to play Seattle in Seattle for the playoffs. That bothers me more than a gamma ray. Because I know God's going to take care of the gamma rays. He said that he would take care of the earth and protect us. I mean, he said he'd do that. But he didn't say anything about protecting the Packers in Seattle. Okay, and that's been bad the last few years. But I'm not worried about these things. I'm just not. And I, I got to kind of laugh, you know. And I know the latest thing now has been global warming for the last 10 or 15 years. Everybody's worried about that. You know, everybody's panicking and, you know, you got to change your lifestyle. I don't know. But all I know is I'm not worried about it. And all I know, too, is 20 years ago, remember this one? Everybody was worried about holes in the ozone. Remember that? 
before global warming, it was the hole in the ozone, man, we got to change our lifestyle, you know, you got to get rid of all the aerosol cans and, you know, turn the whole thing upside down because we're worried about holes in the ozone. I haven't heard anything about that. I think that was debunked shortly afterwards. And, and then you really go back 35, 40 years ago. I remember when I was in high school and shortly after, everybody was worried about an ice age. We're going to have it. We're headed toward another ice age, everybody was saying. So we've gone from panic over heading toward another ice age to now global warming. And it's just one thing after another. And I don't worry about any of those things. I don't worry about the sun burning out in 100 billion years either. Okay, I just don't care. Because I know all these things are under the control of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to keep everything going until it's time to put an end to all things. And uh, because he is in control. That's our Savior. I'm glad I know him. Uh, last part of verse 3. He upholds all things by the word of his power. And then it says, when he, had, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So the Bible says that Jesus himself purged our sins. And that means he washes us clean. And that means that if you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he washes your soul perfectly clean just by receiving him as Lord and Savior. Doesn't matter how filthy and vile your soul may have been, he'll scrub it clean. And it does, you can have five feet of sin crusted over your soul. And, and the blood of Jesus Christ, once you receive him as Lord and Savior, will melt that away instantaneously. Just like the like first time I ever used Tylex on a bathtub. You ever do that? You spray it on it, you don't even have to scrub it. It just, all of a sudden, the mold and stuff just disappears. And uh, that's how you receive Christ and you know, all that crust of sin on your soul gets totally just wiped out, just disappears. He is the brightness of his glory and the express image of himself and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He was made so much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Now, he mentions angels in Jesus, and that's because there was a sect of Judaism back in, uh, in, in, the, in our Lord's day, in the early church. There was a sect of Judaism that taught that the archangel Michael would actually be more powerful and have more authority than the Messiah when he came on the scene. And so God completely destroys that heresy right here. And, you know, angels are wonderful and powerful, but they are nothing compared to Jesus. And he's going to hit on this. Nothing compared to Jesus. You could call me an angel all you want, and that'd be fine because that's a compliment because I'm just a sinful human being. But anybody who calls Jesus an angel is insulting him because he is Almighty God. Now, look at verse 4 again. He was made so much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Jesus is, is better than the angels. And beginning in verse 5, the next verse, God's going to put together an argument proving that he's superior to angels. And, and you might say, well, why did he do that? Why? I don't know. Well, I don't know why people do this, but this is one of those reoccurring heresies. That people want to denigrate Jesus down to the level of an angel. And I already said that some people, what some people were saying back in those days about the Archangel Michael being more powerful than the Messiah. So I already talked about that. But there was also a group of heretics back in that time that Paul dealt with in the book of Colossians. And they taught that Jesus was simply an emanation from the Father, like the angels, and they acted like a stepping stone. So if you wanted to get to God, okay, if you wanted to get to heaven and you wanted to be able to talk to God and have fellowship with God, you had to go through these stepping stones, these angels and these demigods, of which they said Jesus was one. And you made yourself... You know, you, you, you took these steps all the way, and you might, you know, if you're fortunate enough, finally make it to God. Well, Jesus, Jesus is superior to angels. He's, he's not one of these demigods. He's superior to all beings, including angels, including the most powerful angel. And, uh, you know, so that's another reason that God uses this entire section to deal with this subject. But God also knew that there would be a cult that would arise 
in the early part of the 20th century called the Jehovah Witnesses that would promote the heresy that Jesus is the Archangel Michael. Don't, you, don't think for a second that God didn't know that was coming down the line. But it's just a refurbishing, the rehashing of the same old heresy. But anybody who tells you that they're a Christian group is, is either ignorant or they're lying. But I'll tell you this, God is bound and determined and you say, well, how can, they, how can they promote that if it's so crystal clear? I mean, it is crystal clear, isn't it? That God, that Jesus is superior to angels. He just began to say that. He's going to say it over and over again. You say, well, how can they come up with this doctrine that he's an angel? Because they just throw away the word of God. That's all they do. They've got their own translation. And that's what they do. And it's completely foreign to anything that God ever said in the original text. And God is bound and determined to declare to the world and to get people to understand beyond all doubt that, that his son is God. And not just a God, but the eternal God, the creator God, the savior God, the judge God, and the co-equal God, the co-eternal God with him and the Holy Spirit. He, want, he wants to get that through to us. And it's so crystal clear in the word of God that the only way people can deny it is to deny the word of God. So he goes in verse 5, makes his argument, For to which of the angels did he at any time say, You are my son, today I have become your father. So, or as some of your translations probably say, Today I have begotten you. Uh, father said to the son, This day have I begotten you. And, w and whenever you see that phrase begotten, you see that phrase begotten, uh, or the only begotten Son, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, it means His unique or one-of-a-kind Son. Because it is true that the angels are called the sons of God. Christians are called the sons of God as well. But Jesus is the one-of-a-kind, unique Son of God, because He has always existed. And begotten here speaks of the fact that God's eternal Son became a human being. And so Jesus is the unique, eternal Son of God, and he became the unique Son of God incarnate. And God never referred to any angel, including Michael, as his only begotten Son. And he continues in verse 6. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Well, that should be a, a slam dunk to anybody who thinks that Jesus is just an angel. All the angels of God worship him. But... He says, when he brought his firstborn into the world, he said, let all the angels of God worship him. When you think of firstborn, you probably think of the first person born into the family, right? The first child born into the family. Biblically speaking, firstborn doesn't always refer to the first child in a family. Scripturally, firstborn really doesn't have anything to do with chronology. It speaks of the preeminent one or the most important one. It means the one who's in charge, the one who's the provider. The firstborn in the family, if you read scripture, the firstborn in the family was not always the first child born. It was the father who decided who the firstborn was going to be. In other words, it was the father who decided who would take over the family after he died and be in charge of the family and provide for the family as well. So it meant, it meant the preeminent one. So when you see that Jesus is called the firstborn, that's what it means. It means that he's the preeminent one. He's the most important one. He's the one who's in charge, and he's the provider. And this goes along with everything that we've seen already about him in, being in control. And like it says here, the angels worship him because they know that he is God. He's not an angel. Angels don't worship angels. Angels worship God. And the cults may try to tell you that Jesus is just an angel, but this should slam the door shut on that if it hasn't been slammed shut in your mind already. Angels don't worship angels, and angels... Angels don't worship angels. They worship Jesus because they know he's not an angel. They wouldn't dare worship an angel. And not to say that angels aren't powerful and good and holy and useful to God. They are. They're very powerful. Look at verse 7. Of the, angel, of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flame of flames of fire. Spirits, or as it's sometimes translated, winds, also... It speaks of fire, and it speaks of, or it speaks of power and the speed of angels. So they are remarkable beings. They're amazing beings, very fast, very powerful, 
when they serve God, they don't horse around. Although they're not perfect. You know, they get in trouble sometimes. Not moral trouble, not the good angels, but, but they're, they're not perfect. You read the book of Daniel sometimes as fast and as powerful as angels are. Sometimes they get, they get hung up by demons. And then they have to call in for reinforcements. It's amazing when you, when you see a glimpse into eternity in the book of Daniel and what goes on with the angels as they're sent by God to answer our prayers. Sometimes the reason your prayers aren't answered right away may be because God sent an angel and the angel got stifled by a pack of demons or something. It's kind of crazy. It's amazing what goes on in the spiritual realm. But that's why you've got to keep praying. Anyway, got off track there a little bit. Angels are amazing creatures. Powerful and fast. And they're powerful and they're quick to do the will of God. And fortunately for us, part of the will of God for an angel is to serve us, Christians. They're there for us. Then notice verse 8. So he's talking about the angels. Yeah, they're servants and flames of fire. Very powerful. And then verse 8. But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, lasts forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Notice how God the Father calls God the Son, Jesus, God. He calls him God. Your throne, O God, is forever. And that is why, what you see right here, that is why Satan and the cults, why they always try to discredit Christ and the church. That's what they go after. You keep your eye out for this. You'll see it if you haven't noticed it before. The devil does not go after any of the other religions of the world because he already has them in his hip pocket. He doesn't care what the Hindus do or what the Muslims do or what the Buddhists do. He couldn't care less because they're already doing his will. They're distracting from the issue, which is Jesus Christ. He goes after Jesus. And he goes after Christianity because Jesus is the Savior and Satan doesn't want anybody to be saved and because Jesus is God and Satan hates God with a passion. And that's why, that's what I'm saying. That's why whenever you, if you ever investigate Satanism or you ever see any documentaries or anything on them, you will see that they always mock Christianity. What are they, when Satanists worship the devil, one of the things that they do is they recite the Lord's Prayer backwards. Why? Why pick the Lord's Prayer? Because it's a mockery of Christianity. It's a mockery of the words of Jesus. When Satanists worship the devil, they practice what they call the Black Mass. Why? Again, it's, a, it's an attack on Christianity, a form and a mockery of that. It, it's an attack on Christianity. It's the only thing that, they, that, that the devil is concerned about. That should tell us something right there. That should tell us that we've got the right message right there. You know, Satanists never in their worship service recite a Hindu prayer backwards or a Muslim prayer backwards. They don't do that because they're already on his side and he's not threatened by them. But anything that involves Jesus or Christianity is attacked by the devil and uh, by the unsaved of the world, too, who are influenced by him. Well, the Father continues to speak to the Son in verse 9. He's, now, this is God the Father talking to God the Son. He says, You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. You know, that just makes me feel so good that Jesus hates wickedness and loves righteousness. Isn't it nice to have just somebody solid to fall back on? To have a God like that, that you know loves righteousness? You know he's always going to do the right thing. And, you know, and it's not just that, but he's also full of mercy because we all need that because he is righteous. You, you just couldn't ask for a better Savior and a better God than the one that, that we have. But, again, God calls his son, Jesus, God. And he said, your throne, O God, lasts forever. And he also said that the kingdom, the scepter of your kingdom is righteousness. So that is something neat, that everything about Jesus is righteous. Everything about Jesus is right. He never said anything wrong. He never predicted anything wrong. And he never did anything wrong. And he was right when he said that his death on the cross would pay for our sins. The resurrection proved that it did. He was right about that. 
He was right when he said that the Gentiles would crucify him when they got to Jerusalem. Remember he told his disciples that? When we get to Jerusalem, Gentiles are going to crucify me. He was right about that. He was right when he said that he would be raised from the dead three days after he was crucified. He was right about that. He was also right when he said, nobody comes to the Father except through me. He was right when he said that those who endure to the end shall be saved. He was right also. He was right on everything else. So he's right too when he said that someday you're going to hear the voice, his voice, when you're in your grave. And you're going to be raised from the dead. You're going to hear his voice personally. And you're going to be raised from the dead, along with all your friends and loved ones who knew Jesus as well. And he was right when he said that some would be raised to everlasting life and some would be raised and thrown into everlasting hell. And he was right when he said that he would come again to judge. And so, right about everything, you can always count on him. People don't have to agree with him, and they can reject him. But they should know that he's right. You know? And I think a lot of people that don't even receive Christ, or maybe are putting it off, like the idea that there's something real out there, something that is objectively, completely true, it's kind of comforting to know that. And maybe some of this, I'm sure a lot of those people deny it because they're afraid of the fact that it's true. But anyway, verse 10. It says, God the Father still talking to him. In verse 10, And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the works of your hands. I don't know how many times God hits on this in his word, but every time he does, I'm going to talk about it so that, so that people can get this straight once and for all. People do not have to believe that Jesus is God and that he is the creator because this is a free country and people can believe whatever in the world they want to. But I can tell you this, and I know this for a fact. A person is either deceived or ignorant or a liar if they say that the Bible doesn't teach that Jesus is the eternal God, the creator God, because it certainly does. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then here it says, and you, Lord, talking to Jesus, God the Father talking to Jesus, and you, Lord, in the beginning, have laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. And so there you have it, crystal clear. Verse 11 and 12. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all wear out like a garment. As a cloak, you will fold them up, and they will be changed. So Jesus made all things. Jesus rules all things, and he's going to change all things. He's going to, he's going to fold up the entire universe like you would fold up a garment, like you fold up your, a towel after you do laundry or something. The Bible teaches he's going to destroy everything that he made, and, but it's not going to stay like that because he's going to make a new earth for his people in new heavens as well. But everything that you see is going to be destroyed and made new. Jesus is going to fold them all up and change them, make them brand new. I like verse 12. As a cloak, you will fold them up and they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will not end. So everything is going to change except Jesus. He'll never be any different than what he is right now. The Son of God is all-powerful, always will be all-powerful. And the Son of God knows everything about everything and everything about everyone, and he always will. You know, that, that attacks a heresy, too, because the latest attack on, on God that's been going around, and, and I'm sad to say this is not a part of a cult. This is a part of mainline evangelicalism now that God is evolving. Where in the world they get that from, I have no idea. But that's what they say. God is evolving. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He knows more now than what he did 100 years ago. And 100 years from now, he's going to know more than what he does now. Are you out of your mind? You know? Well, you get your head out of the psychology book and get it into the Bible, you know? How can you miss that? Just read the Bible through once every year, Okay? And, and you'll never fall prey to this garbage. But that's the latest. It's true. How can they say that in light of this, right? Well, I guess the same way that Jehovah Witness can say he's the Archangel Michael. What? Well, you know, you just say it. And the people believe. 
But he'll never change. He's the only thing that will not change. Always righteous, always all powerful, always know everything. God, Son of God will be able to keep you. Right now, he's able to keep you for the day of salvation. Always will be able to keep you for the day of salvation, no matter what kind of trouble you run into either. You may run into a lot of trouble and a lot of stress in the future. You think, oh man, am I going to hang in there? The Son of God is able to keep you for the day of salvation. No problem for him because he doesn't change. He doesn't get weaker. He doesn't get stronger. He's immutable. That's one of the fundamental doctrines of theology is the immutability of God and Jesus. And so, nothing to worry about. Everything's going to change except Jesus. Never be different than what he is right now. So, you know, those who are waiting for a revised Jesus, uh, who's going to change his mind about sin, are wasting their time. Are those who are waiting for a revised Jesus who are going to tolerate sinners who don't repent and receive him are going to have to wait and wait and wait. And he'll be doing most of that waiting in hell because he's never going to change his mind about any of those things. He, it, it just is what it is because it's truth. 13. To which of the angels did he at any time say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? You know that the right hand of a king it's always reserved for the person who can step in if, uh, if he's sick or something. Sort of like a vice president. You know? President goes under the knife. You have to swear in the vice president for a while. The person at the right hand of the king was that, was that person who had to be qualified to step in. It was usually a queen mother. Mother of the king. Sitting at the right hand of the king. King gets sick. Something happens to the king. His mother, the person at the right hand, would step in. So when you see that Jesus, whenever you hear that phrase that we so often hear, we probably don't even think about what it means, <clears throat> he ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father? You know what that is? That is a huge proclamation of the deity of Jesus Christ and the fact that he's co-equal with the Father. Because who in the world could step in and rule for God except God himself? He's at the right hand of the Father. He can step in because he is God. That's a great, that's a great testimony to his deity. 14. Uh, still talk, now he's talking about angels. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to minister to those who will inherit salvation? You ever hear people say that um, everybody has a guardian angel? I don't know where they got that from, but you won't find that anywhere in Scripture. That everybody has a guardian angel? I'm not saying that God doesn't ever send an angel to, to guard people. But I do know what scripture says. And that's that it doesn't say, well, number one, I know it doesn't say that. That everybody has a guardian angel. But what it does say, the only thing I know for sure is that you have one. If you're a Christian. Say, Christians have guardian angels. Who, who, what are angels? They're ministering spirits sent forth to minister, to help those who will inherit eternal life. Who are the people who have eternal life? The people who know Jesus. Christians, for sure, have a guardian angel. I do know that for a fact. And probably a lot more than one. I, you know, sometimes I think about that. If we could just get eyes that could see into the spiritual realm, we would be shocked who are sitting in these empty seats or standing around us, you know, not just angels, but demons, you know, trying to distract people from the word of God or whatever. But we all have angels if we belong to Christ, at least one, ministering to us and helping us whenever we need it. So we'll stop right there. Hopefully we understand that Jesus is superior to angels, if nothing else, after this chapter. Lord, we thank you for your word. I ask that you would bless these people. Thank you for everybody who came this morning. I pray that you would bless them for coming. I pray that you would bless them spiritually. I pray that we were all edified and fed and that if nothing else, we leave today appreciating you more, Jesus. I, I know we were reminded of you and your greatness. And so I pray that it sticks with us and affects how we live and affects how we treat each other. Watch over us, Lord, and our loved ones and friends, body, soul, and spirit. And I pray that you bring us again together next time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.